All right, we're good to go, brother. All right, thank you. The uh, title for this presentation comes from my work contributing to the blog Voice of Moreau. The idea of writing short bios of Brothers of Holy Cross, now expanded to include priests of Holy Cross and sisters of the Holy Cross serving in the United States, was pitched to me in uh, 2018 by religion teacher Ben Rossi, now Brother Ben Rossi, while we both ministered at Archbishop Hoban High School in Akron, Ohio. Little did I know then that my interest in our CSC four parents would become an obsession and my delight. Since 2018, I have now done well over 150 bios of congregational members, those whose fame is internationally known by most CSCs, and many bios of CSC religious who few know. All of these vignettes taken as a small collective out of hundreds more to be done have proved to me that the grounding of Holy Cross in the New World, specifically in St. Joseph County along the banks of the St. Joseph River and beyond is because of the treasures brought to and offered to Father Edward Soren by those gifted with great intellect and by those who might not be able to read or write, but the gift small as it may have been allowed Notre Dame du Lac to flourish. A fine example of this gift giving is Brother Columba O'Neill, who was born in 1848, died in 1923, who in 1873 hears about the brothers at Notre Dame from a wandering cobbler who had learned his trade at the manual labor school. John O'Neill wanted to join the Franciscans, yet because of his club foot and dramatic limp, was told that he need not apply. Hearing about the Holy Cross brothers, he immediately began the trek from California to Notre Dame, where he was greeted by Father Augustin Louage, an early form of vocation promoter, who takes him to see Father Soren. In so many words, Soren asked John, what can you do? I am a cobbler. And in so many words, Soren accepts this gift. And in 1874, Brother Columba begins his shoemaking and eventually becomes known in his own lifetime as the divine healer and the miracle man of Notre Dame. Each of the nine brothers I have included in this presentation brought simple gifts, some made of gold and others made from marrow. We'll begin with Brother Marcellinus Kinsella. So we're on the right slide. Marcellinus was born in uh, 1874, lived to be, lived until uh, 1914, and he was a, uh, a teacher. In fact, he was a master educator. A couple quotes from various sources from the Journal Gazette that was published in Fort, in Fort Wayne in 1914. Uh, the, the quote is, Brother Marcellinus, one of the ablest and best known teaching brothers of the Congregation of Holy Cross, died Wednesday morning at Notre Dame. To scores of Fort Wayne friends and particularly the students of Central Catholic High School, the announcement of his demise will be received with profound regret from the Scholastic dated December 20, 1886. Upon the invitation of Frank McIrlin, Brother Marcellinus spent Thursday hunting eight miles north. The report that no game is left in the state is without foundation, as is also the one that 13 pheasants and nine rabbits committed suicide upon hearing that Brother Marcellinus was on the grounds. They were the lawful bag of a good day's sport, as were several squirrels, a young fox and two blue jays. Again from the Scholastic in 1894. Brother Marcellinus, who for years was head of the commercial department at Notre Dame, and who is now director of St. Columkill School in Chicago, celebrated on Monday last the silver jubilee of his entrance into the Congregation of Holy Cross. At St. Columkill, Chicago, he left behind not only golden memories, but a superb company of young men, many of them priests, to cherish his name. For 25 years, he has been identified with the cause of education and few instructors have met with greater success. And now shortly before he died, shortly prior to the 70th anniversary commencement at the University of Notre Dame this year, Brother Marcellinus was stricken with apoplexy of the brain and since that time, his condition has been critical. 
For the past week, his death has been hourly expected. The final summons came on Wednesday when he passed away at the community house where he had been making his home for a year. Owing to his long service as a teacher over 40 years, Brother Marcellinus remained at Notre Dame and during the past year since his retirement from Fort Wayne, taught classes in the commercial department. His duties were not heavy and he appeared in his usual health until stricken in June. The beloved teacher was about 67 years of age and throughout his long career in the classroom was eminently successful in all of his activities. He taught at practically, at practically all the higher educational institutions of the Congregation of Holy Cross and was a religious of keen intellectual capacity and administrative ability. A number of Chicago's leading business and professional men were students of Brother Marcellinus and so popular was he with the Chicago Notre Dame alumni that no reunion was deemed complete unless he was in attendance. His death is a distinct loss to the great community of which he was devoted and an exemplary member. Let's move now to Brother Paul of the Cross O'Connor, called the esteemed prefect, born in 1850. He was born in Ireland, he entered the community in 1867. And for 25 years, he had been a prefect in the senior department and was zealous to promote the happiness and welfare of the students. Brother Paul, at the time he died, was the brother who basically put football on the map for the University of Notre Dame. At the death of Brother Paul of the Cross has been a great shock and a cause of intense sour to the, sorrow to the members of Bronson Hall with whom he was very closely connected as prefect. The last fatal illness was such a short duration that it is almost impossible real, to realize that he is gone. All are firm in the conviction that the place vacated by Brother Paul will be hard to fill. Dying on December 12, 1893 at the age of 42, he had been identified with Notre Dame for 28 years, most of that time as a prefect, but also as a leadership in athletics. He was a fine physique and a handsome man, as leading spirit in founding athletic association and as chairman of the board of control, he laid foundation for the modern athletic system. A vigorous athlete himself, and director of athletics at the time of his death. In the early days of the school's football career, Brother Paul was the only member of the campus religious who was an athletic zealot. He was manager of the first four Irish teams back in the days of caps and handlebar mustaches. And finally, the enthusiastic boom predicted by the scholastic was not long in getting underway for in the following week, a meeting was held on the Notre Dame campus to form a rugby team. Brother Paul managed the first four Notre Dame 11s, that would be the football teams. It was he who suggested that the campus 11s be organized and was instrumental in securing uniforms for them. And he was uh, the person who basically made sure that uh, Notre Dame would play schools like uh, Michigan. And here is a final quote. Apropos of the renewal of athletic relations with uh, Michigan, Notre Dame gratefully recalls the day in 1888 when Ann Arbor authorities sent their team at the request of Brother Paul to teach us the art of football. Last week in Cleveland, Mr. Ernest M. Sprague, one of those Michigan sportsmen died. You are asked to pray for his soul. He refereed the game when a Notre Dame man crushed into the Wolverine quarterback after he had signaled for a fair catch, then knocked the ball from his hands, scooped it up and thundered down the field for a touchdown. Mr. Sprague disallowed it and penalized Notre Dame. In only split second, he said, 150 wild Irishmen were around my neck. Brother Paul saved me, raised his hand, asked for silence and said, these boys are our guests. We invited them to teach us the game. Mr. Sprague knows the rules. 
And Mr. Sprague replied, lucky for me, from the rule book, I satisfied Brother Paul and the boys. I had treated them apparently fairly. Now we move to Brother Paul the Hermit McIntyre. He's known as the zealous one. Again, a report from the time of his death. In the death of Brother Paul the Hermit, John McIntyre at St. Joseph Hospital last Thursday afternoon, the Congregation of Holy Cross lost one of its most zealous members. For many years past, since 1906, the deceased was an Assistant Superior General of the community. He was born in Superior and at the age of 17 entered St. Joseph Novitiate at Notre Dame. For the 18 years subsequent to his profession, he served most ably as secretary of the university. In a letter that he wrote to Father Soren, Brother Paul says, once more, I beg leave to trouble you with a request to be permitted to accompany the missionaries who are about to start for Bengal. I may not be much service in India, but I do wish for a trial. At the time of my profession, my vows were accepted by my superiors with the full knowledge that I had the desire for this work, which I have ever since been craving you to assign me. Do not refuse me, very Reverend Father, the chance to complete the sacrifice of myself for the greater honor of God and the good of my own soul. Remember the many times I have besieged you, even at the risk of earning your displeasure. His request for the third time was refused by Father Soren. Staying at Notre Dame, he went on to be the business manager for the Ave Maria Press, a master of novices, assistant superior general, and for the last two years before he died as superintendent of construction and accommodation work at Notre Dame. His work in all of these offices was marked with fidelity, with zeal and efficiency. Despite the handicap of, El, of ill health during many years, he labored entirely untiringly in the service of religion and education and was often able to attend to his strenuous duties only by the wonderful strength of will for which he was so remarkable. An ideal religious with many great gifts of mind and heart, Brother Paul fulfilled his vocation in a manner worthy of the highest admiration that he may rece be received quickly the rich reward for which he lives so consistently is the heartfelt prayer of everyone who knew him. Brother Leopold Kull, the musician who becomes the candy man. Leopold was born in Germany, came to this country when he was 17. He was the second oldest of his family of nine and he needed to find work. And so the family moved from New York to Philadelphia and then to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, where there was a large German population. Brother Leopold fell behind in his studies because of shifting residences. So he left school to help support his family and he gained employment in a music store and there learned to play violin, which became his favorite instrument. He arrived at Notre Dame and was professed under the name of Brother Leopold in the last year of the Civil War. He was rejected for more service because of throat ailment. Knowing music as he did, he was soon put in charge of the little choir at Notre Dame. He taught music for some years and was a violinist of rare merit, but he had no wish to display his talents. Fortunately, he had brought his violin with him, but kept it concealed in his trunk. It was the practice of superiors in those early days to search through all belongings of a candidate. The superior found the violin and reported this to Father Soren. Brother Leopold was called to Soren's office. Could he play the violin? Somewhat reluctantly, he admitted the fact. How well could he play? In his modesty, he declined to say. But Father Soren had ways of finding out. And the result was that Brother Leopold was set up as a professor of violin. Over the next 40 plus years, he estimated that he taught over 600 Notre Dame musicians, violin, flute, cello, piano, and voice. And during these early years, he also worked as the printer for the Ave Maria. When he finally grew too feeble to be a professor, he desired to continue working, 
and was gratified when he was appointed as the candy man for the students. Known as Brother Leaps, he sold lemonade and cakes and cookies, laying aside a tidy penny for the university. His store suffered many movings about, but for two generations of Notre Dame students, Leaps meant largely lemonade and fours. The fours referred to is a chocolate covered cookie topped with a walnut. There were other confections indicated by numbers of one, two, three, four, on up to 16, but fours was the popular number. His lemonade was mixed in great wooden tubs, and it was a hearty drink to students who were threatened with expulsion if they attempted anything stronger. For a nickel, the students of Father Kavanaugh's regime could get a large glass of lemonade and two fours. Brother Leopold spent nearly 80 years as a man of prayer and work. As a tiny shrunken old man, he kept laboring on to the very end. In the last 10 years of his life, when he lived in the community house, he would trudge along with his wheelbarrow, gathering twigs and branches that littered the grounds. He was forever busy. His humility was traditional and all his life, he thought himself only the lowest of the lowly. This is a quote from Brother Aiden's extracts, but one has only to look into the childlike simplicity of his face, into those fadest, faded, sightless blue eyes to catch a glimpse of an effulgence far from mundane. Uh, you'll notice he died in 1935, so he lived to be 99 years of age. Brother Stanislaus Clark. Brother Stanislaus Clark was born in 1838 and he entered the community when he was 26 years old. He was a capable student and became a, promoted, a proponent of promoting the use of shorthand. He taught the system of what was called sound writing at Notre Dame for many years and made many personal improvements to the system. Sir Isaac Pittman, who invented shorthand in 1837, considered Brother Stanislaus both a scholarly colleague and a good friend. Father Daniel Hudson, who was appointed the editor of the Ave Maria in 1875, considered Brother Stanislaus to be one of the early founders of the press and the periodical. In 1865, Father Soren proposed to the sisters that they publish a magazine in honor of our Blessed Mother. The vote was unanimous and Mother Angela Gillespie and her sisters pledged themselves to assist Father Soren in this great work. Father Soren was the first publisher of the Ave Maria. He was followed by Father Neil Gillespie, Mother Angela's brother. In, eight, in February of 1873, the actual printing was turned over to the sisters who received their first lessons from Brother Stanislaus. Stanislaus taught shorthand at Holy Cross College in New Orleans for several years. And in his 18, uh, 1916 obituary published in the Scholastic, he was called a model of every Christian and religious virtue and a man of very talents, all of which he faithfully employed in the service of God for nearly a half century. On to Brother Cajetan Gallagher. Brother Cajetan was known affectionately as Cadge and he was described as a simple soul. He was born in New York and in 1881, when he had been in the community for a few years, he began to care for Father Soren's princes in St. Edward Hall. What it meant was he had charge of the minims and was the male counterpart to Sister Aloysius Mulcair. Brother Cadge worked with the minims for 46 years until the school was terminated in 1927. He would march around the campus of the University of Notre Dame with a sawed off broom handle, which he called his wand, and he would gently tap the ankles of his charges to keep them in line when they were out for a walk. Cadge was the good cop, gentle, the kids loved him. He seemed like a shepherd guarding his sheep. Sister Aloysius was the bad cop, she was the disciplinarian. Brother Cajetan was a man of piety and he wrestled with God in prayer. Once when Father Kavanaugh received a letter from a parent of one of the minims complaining that Cadge was a man of uncommon profanity, he thought the matter worth investigation. 
So he interrogated the Minim who volunteered the information that Brother Cajetan swears after we all go to bed at night. Father Kavanaugh stationed someone to listen. After the children had retired, sure enough, sighs and groans emanated from Brother's chamber in awesome waves through the walls of his tiny cell. Lord God, Lord God, be merciful to me, a sinner. O oh God Almighty, have pity on me. Father Kavanaugh expressed himself satisfied with Brother Cajetan's profanity, and he was known to make the remark, if Brother Cajetan's prayers are not heard in heaven, they certainly have been heard here on earth. On to Brother Basil Magnus. From the Scholastic regarding his obituary, it was a sorrowful message the church bells announced to us on Friday, February 12th, 1909. Another member of Holy Cross has been called to his reward. A member long esteemed and loved by all, Brother Basil. He left suddenly, but not unprepared. His entire life has been an act of preparation for the supreme moment. Brother Basil was a man of extraordinary modesty. When he joined the congregation of Holy Cross, he came with no blare of trumpets. It was not known then or afterward until it was accidentally discovered that he was gifted with a genius for music, that in all America, there were few who knew the contents of musical literature as he did, and fewer still could interpret them with such exquisite delicacy and feeling. Genius seldom hides, this comes by the way from Brother Evan Schmid, who wrote an article called One Man's Music. Genius seldom hides, and when it does, someone uncovers it. For some months after Brother Basil joined the congregation in 1852, he revealed nothing of his musical background he had acquired in Bavaria, Germany. The fact was that he had been something of a child prodigy, playing viola when he was eight years old and learning the violin previous to that age. Brother Maximilian E. Garrick, a music teacher at Notre Dame, discovered Brother Basil. No longer could the modest religious hide the fact that he excelled at piano and organ and pro uh, proficiently played on many instruments, among them oboe and flute. Professor Garrick is believed to be the founder of the music department at Notre Dame, and the list of the faculty members in 1852 contains just one musician, Brother Basil. He was the organist at Sacred Heart Church for 56 unbroken years. This was his only assignment for the entirety of his religious life. And perhaps he was best memorialized by renowned Holy Cross poet, Father Charles O'Donnell, who wrote when he died an ode called The Dead Musician. This is the first verse of that. He was the player and the played upon. He was the actor and the acted upon artist and yet himself a substance wrought, God played on him as he upon the key, moving his soul to mightiest melodies of lowly serving his austerities and only thought that our high dream out tops. He was an organ where God kept the stops. Not, not of all he gave us came so wondrous clear as that he sounded to the master's ear. Brother John Chrysostom Will. Brother John Chrysostom was a Civil War vet. He was a beekeeper. He was a researcher. And in a letter that he wrote on June the 5th in 1887, he writes to Father Soren, on this day 24 years ago, I was in the line of battle awaiting the charge. We were being shelled at the time, and I heard in a clear, distinct voice, you will die today. I knew it was no human voice, and I was perfectly conscious of the certainty of death. I prayed fervently, as I had never prayed before, to our sweet mother, that if she would intercede for me and get me safely out, that I would surely delay, delay no longer in responding to the call that was continually urging me to apply to some religious community for admission. I had hardly concluded my prayer when the same voice said, you will only be hurt today. And so it happened. I delayed three years after the war in fulfilling my promise when I enlisted under the banner of Holy Cross. 
Mark Will was born in 1839 in Pennsylvania and entered Holy Cross in, 18, uh, in 1867. He served throughout the Civil War in the 54th Pennsylvania Regiment, taking part in many of the fiercest battles. Soon after the fire destroyed the main building at the University of Notre Dame, Brother John Christensen wrote to Father Soren from Galveston, Texas, where he was superior, quote, I, uh, I could hardly realize at first that my dear alma mater was a heap of unsightly ruins. My regret for the loss and my sympathy for you were so great that I felt it would be mockery on my part to attempt to give expression to my feelings unless I would send you something to repair the loss. You must not for a moment take the enclosed draft of $500 to be the measure of that sympathy and my regret for the loss of those fine buildings. Upon his death in 1919, this short obituary was posted in the Scholastic. There passed away at Notre Dame on Friday, May 6, at the age of 80, Brother John Chrysostom, former assistant master of novices at St. Joseph Novitiate, and for many years commander of the Notre Dame post of the GAR. As a young man, the deceased did valiant services throughout the Civil War at Gettysburg and many other fields on behalf, in behalf of the Union. At the end of the war, he joined the Congregation of Holy Cross at Notre Dame, and since that time has been intimately associated with the furtherance of the works of the community. John Chrysostom had two hobbies, beekeeping and researching the life and ministry of Russian Prince Father Galitston, who renounced his heritage and became a missionary in Pennsylvania. As a beekeeper, the novitiate was never without honey and uh, brother contributed frequently to magazines about bee culture. By the many priests and brothers who as novices under his direction knew him intimately, he will long be remembered as an example of genuine spirituality and fervent loyalty to the interest of the congregation. And we'll end up now with Brother Charles Borromeo Harding. An architect and basically the builder of the University of Notre Dame. Patrick Harding was born in Ireland. He entered the congregation in 1862. He was a carpenter's son and he became a self-taught institutional builder and construction manager involved in almost every new addition to Notre Dame's physical plant between 1868 and 1911. St. Edward's Hall, Corby Hall, Dujari Hall, the Institute of Technology, the current uh, Sacred Heart Basilica, the Boathouse are all the extent of his designs. He also built two wings of Soren Hall, the Fieldhouse Gymnasium, the Manual Labor School, the Ave Maria offices, the Community House, and the Portanuncula Chapel. And he also built the first post office. In 1879, he also served as the supervising architect of the main building. Finally, in the 1880s, he oversaw the building of the dome and a spire which growing, going up simultaneously. There are no records that indicate that he had taken any courses in construction or architectural renderings. Tradition has it that Brother Charles used unsawn tree trunks from the Michigan hardwood forest as the inner structural supports around which he fashioned the piers that support Sacred Heart's vaulted roof. The minutes from the meetings of Notre Dame Council of Administration for 1897-1900 illustrate how greatly Brother Charles' service, services were in demand and how extensive his contributions to the growth of Notre Dame. A few postings, January 22nd, 1897. Brother Charles Borromeo is authorized to build the two wings at Soren Hall at an estimate of $12,000. March 26, 1897, Brother Charles is requested to make a plan and an estimate to enlarge the gymnasium. April 9th, 1897, Brother Charles is directed to make plans and specifications for the new manual labor school to be, to be ready for September. March 18th, 1898, the Portanuncula Chapel is to be taken down 
and the bricks used for the new gymnasium. September 22nd, 1899, Brother Charles was appointed to draw the plans for the new community house. Stones and bricks are to be ordered and the construction to begin at once. March 23rd, 1900, it was directed to erect one more wing of the new community house at Mount St. Vincent. His competence extended beyond Notre Dame to the University of Portland, where he worked from 1911 to 1922 and built the Sisters Convent. Because of his age, he was sent back to Notre Dame, but he had to stop in Salt Lake City and seek assistance from the Sisters Hospital, where he eventually died. He is buried in the cemetery here at Notre Dame. In, 18, in 1983, archivist brother Edward Sniatecki wrote, Brother Charles Borromeo was always quiet and retired in manner, a genuine, gentle, and courageous religious, a man of deep faith and sincere piety, which was never showy. He loved the rule and practiced it, and practiced it with fidelity. And there ends the report on the nine brothers. I can entertain any kinds of questions that folks might have. Uh, and that is, uh, that's up to the audience if you, have, if you have anything. Okay. Thank you, Brother Phillips. Thank you. It was really good. I, I think I learned a lot. Well, that was what we were supposed to do. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions to ask? Brother Phil, how many of these did you say you've done now? I've done about 150, and about 117 of them have been posted on the blog. Okay. I've also included uh, Priest of Holy Cross and Sisters of the Holy Cross. You sure you don't want to come back to Hoban and do this, huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm quite happy here in the archives because the research is a lot easier than it was at Hoban. Well, I'm glad somebody is recording all of this. We, we are afraid we're losing our institutional memory as we have less and less brothers and less connection with all of this history. Uh, it's good for us to hear about these folks and, and the people who have come before us. So thank you for all your work. You're very welcome. And I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, I think it is absolutely essential that we uh, maintain the legacy of persons, of individuals, of men and women who have uh, definitely contributed in all manner of ways to uh, not only the building of Notre Dame, but just to the grounding of the congregation uh, throughout the world and specifically in the United States. What motivates you to do this work? Um, I think I'm obsessive compulsive by my very nature. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> inquisitive so uh would have made a very fine librarian i suppose because i like things that can be put in alphabetical order or in chronological order one can then maintain uh that uh i think that moving perhaps my 50 years as a teacher was moving children out of chaos into some kind of uh stability when it uh, comes to uh intellectual things mm -hmm. oh well what, what did you teach when you were a teacher? Uh, primarily an English teacher. Uh, I taught music also, uh, smattering of French, but primarily I was an English teacher and a writing teacher in uh, the schools uh, where, I, where I worked. Oh, nice. Uh, okay. Well, if anyone else has any more questions, and if not, we can you know, close this out and everyone can get a break before the next session starts. Um, so we have the chat rooms that are coming up as well um, from I think 2.20 Central Daylight Time, and then uh, sessions will start back up at 3 o'clock Central Daylight Time. So thank you again, Brother Phil. Um, I, I'm excited and glad that you know these are recorded so anyone can go back and watch and listen to them and really get a grasp of all 
nine of these brothers that you had shared in their story, because um, they are, I think, not just inspirational, but a better understanding of our history of Holy Cross. Um, so thank you, and you know, I hope to see everyone soon. Thank you very much, too.